Hey, Henry. Hey. Yeah, hey. while we're uh, waiting for other folks to arrive, I'd like to talk to you maybe sometime later today about the uh, House Bill 4079 project in your trail again. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. I saw Joe's updated TFR for that. And I think we just submitted some kind of general comments on their land use plan. But yeah, happy to connect. I'm available like round three, Rick. Okay, good. I'll reach out to you. Okay. <clears throat> So it's Groundhog Day. Happy Groundhog Day. It's a Zoom call. It always feels like Groundhog yeah. Day. <laughs> Another virtual meeting. Like exactly. Groundhog Day. Yeah, and we're supposed to supposedly get getting six more weeks of winter, but getting given that we've only had about 10 days of winter this year, you know, maybe we'll actually get have some wintry weather at some point. Well, that's what happened last year. We had sort of a nice January and then we got that big snowstorm in February. So maybe we'll get snow. I was actually in, I was in Punxsutawney a couple years ago and uh, I was really confused because it doesn't look anything like the movie Groundhog Day, which I found out <laughs> after they apparently filmed in <laughs> Illinois. But I drove like multiple hours from Pittsburgh to get to Punxsutawney and yeah, it's not all that it's cracked out to be. I'll tell you that much. Is it small? It's very small. It's a beautiful area, <laughs> beautiful part of the state, but it's, you know, it's poor Pennsylvania town. Yeah, yeah. And apparently they really drug the groundhog, so it doesn't claw or bite anyone. So it's, I think it's dependent on how, <laughs> how much they give the groundhog, whether he sees his shadow or not. And what's the lifespan of a groundhog? Do they just name the next one Phil? Know. Or is it actually like the child of Phil? <laughs> Phil the second? Yeah. Probably yeah. Phil the 30th. Phil the 23rd. <laughs> <laughs> because they're like they're like marmots and rock checks. I mean, it's what four years, something I don't like know that. Hmm. Well, and those sedatives are giving it, you know, not helping anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the Groundhog Day celebration in Bend is a uh, supposedly going to be a group of protesters outside by Worrell Park that the the board has talked about um, raising part of it to have some parking spaces for the county courthouse. And there's a, a group that wants to save World Park. So, And apparently there. there's a contest to see if somebody can find a groundhog, which they're everywhere, yeah. but not this time of year. Yeah, yeah I was going to say good luck unless you're looking <laughs> subterranean in February. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> find I thought, that doesn't sound like a good idea to have people go digging around for those for rock <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Yeah, one of my uh, coworkers, when he took his kids to Yellowstone, there was a little, or Yellowstone Zoo, I forget which, but they had, see the yellow-bellied marmot. They're like, oh, great, let's go see what that is. And he goes, wait a minute, that's just a rock chuck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I think, I think we have a quorum, don't we, Cameron? I have seven here present, so seven of the 11 we have sitting should be a quorum. All right. Well, I will share my screen. Oops. All right. Everybody see my screen? Yes. All right. We'll get rolling. I'll call the meeting to order of the Bend MPO Technical Advisory Committee on February 2nd, 2022. And we'll just do a quick round of introductions. Um, my screen fixed here. So I'm Tyler Deakey, MPO manager. Uh, Andrea, introduce yourself. Andrea Napoli, senior planner in MPO. Sharon. Uh, Sharon Smith, Ben LaPine Schools. Henry? Uh, Henry Stroud, I'm a planner with the Ben Park and Recreation District. Cameron? 
Cameron Crouch, I break two. I'm your minutes taker. David Emerton. David Emerton, ODOT, Planning and Programming. Peter. Peter Russell, Deschutes County Senior Transportation Planner. Greg. Uh, Greg Bryant, resident. Uh, Liza. We couldn't Liza. hear you, but I could see you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Dave Thompson. Dave Thompson, Deschutes County Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee. Uh, Wendy. Uh, Wendy Holzman, citizen. Casey. Morning, this is Casey Berry with OSU Cascades. All right, Rick. Uh, Rick Williams, ODOT Region 4 Planning. Jenny. Jenny Umberger, City of Bend Program Coordinator. All right, and Doreen Tai. Uh, Doreen Tai, Public Citizen. All right, thank you, everyone. Um, hopefully everybody's pretty familiar with Zoom protocols at this point, so I will skip over this. Unless, unless Groundhog anyone, Day. Yeah, unless anyone has any questions, and I'll jump on, then move on to our meeting minutes. In your packet, there were draft minutes from the December 1st, 2021 meeting. Does anyone have any questions? And if not, I'll seek a motion and a second to approve those minutes. I move um, approval of the December first 2021 draft meeting minutes is presented i'll second all right any discussion all right all in favor aye aye aye, aye. thank you our next agenda item is an update on our annual obligation report and i will turn it over to andrea yeah thanks tyler so if you can go ahead and go to the next slide so this is, a, this is an information only item for you. So there isn't any recommendation needed here. Um, so MPOs are federally required to publish an annual listing of projects where federal funds have been obligated. So obligation, meaning the federal government's legal commitment to pay the federal share of a project's cost. So federal share, meaning the amount minus any match, match dollars. Um, and this, what we're talking about is federal fiscal year 2021, which runs from October 1st of 2020 through um, this last September 30th of, of 2021. So the purpose of an annual obligation report is, uh, you know, to increase the transparency of government spending on transportation projects, and then also to show the progress that's been made on projects that we have programmed in our Metropolitan Transportation Improvement Program. Um, it's, it's something that's prepared at the end of every federal fiscal year to tell, uh, you know, what actually happened with the federal funding shown in our MTIP during that fiscal year. So in other words, you know, our MTIP lists projects expected to be funded by year, but the obligation report reveals how that actually shook out. Next slide. So in total, we had approximately 31 million um, in federal funds obligated in federal fiscal year 2021, and just over 300,000 in deobligated funds. So this is something that happens when, you know, maybe a project is finished, but not all funds were spent, or a project phase was changed to a later year. So these funds aren't lost, they just weren't used or used entirely for the year that they were programmed. Next slide. So this slide shows the amounts obligated this past federal fiscal year by funding program. So you'll see, for example, our MPO STBG um, funding program. We have our planning dollars, safety, uh, some FTA transit funds, uh, and then the infra grant from the FAST Act. Next slide. And here we show our top three obligated amounts by project for federal fiscal year uh, 21. So the largest being Bend North Corridor, 
followed by US-20 ribbon samples to Greenwood, um, and then US-20 Tumalo to Cooley Road. Next slide. So this is, this is the last slide here, uh, just a timeline for our reporting. So October was the end of uh, fiscal year 21. In November, we created the report, posted it online. Um, and then for 2022, uh, we had presentation to the policy board last month and then to you today. So the full report is on our, uh, on the MPO's uh, webpage, if you would like to see the details. Uh, any questions? on the annual obligation report? Yeah, I've got a question, Andrea. Yeah. Uh, okay, on the projects you're showing $31 million and at some odd dollars, and then you had the deallocated de de funds of 325, but does that mean that there, we actually spent $31 million this that fiscal year? Yeah, so go, but I think it's a slide prior to that, Tyler. Yeah, ours, the, that, that 31 is the amount that was obligated for, for that last fiscal year. And then the 325 no, yeah, was, actually, was, wasn't, was, yeah. Okay, okay. And Just then the me. next slide breaks it down by funding program. Right, right, okay. Any other questions? All right, Tyler, I think we're... Move on to the next item. All right. We're rolling. We'll be out here at 10 30 <laughs> this pace. Um, so, I'm just going to give you a quick update on uh, development of our work program for this next uh, fiscal year. And Andrea will chime in uh, as well. So, some of you probably we've, have seen this before, but one of the things we have to do at the MPO is prepare an annual work program. It's called our UPWP. And it identifies all of the work that we're going to be doing uh, in the over the course of the fiscal year, but it also includes all transportation planning that's happening within the MPO area uh, during that same period of time. So it includes projects that ODOT's managing, City of Bend may, may be managing, and so on. And just a background slide here, just as a reminder for everyone, you know, who funds, where do we get our funding to operate the MPO? Um, the vast majority of our funding is federal funding. Um, there's uh, two different sources from the Federal Highway Administration. The PL, that's planning funding. Uh, that's uh, been a good, that's a good share of our funding. We get a small amount of funding from the Federal Transit Administration. And then we also flex part of our STBG or surface transportation block grant funding uh, to maintain our staffing levels. Um, we also get a little bit of state funding from ODOT, and then we also uh, use in-kind contributions as match for those FTA funds. This slide just shows a summary of the funding, historical funding that has come into the MPO. It doesn't show those STBG funding, but it shows the PL and 5303 funds, which are historically the two main sources of funding for MPO operations. You can see that our funding, it's increased over the last decade, but not uh, significantly. Um, there was actually, there's been years of decline and, uh, and so on. And I think as those, if you look through that and see those numbers kind of fluctuating, that's what's driven uh, the need for us to utilize some of our, those STBG dollars uh, to help maintain our staffing levels. And I think at the same time, you'll know, point out that you know, during that time frame, we were one of the fastest growing metro, you know, MPO areas in the country, uh, and we've led the state, uh, you know, in population growth and employment growth during that time frame. Uh, I got a question for you. Kelly. Yes. On that one, is uh, are, are is that are all the MPOs allocated the same way, or are they changed by by the population basis or something like that? Yeah, we have a. There's a formula. Uh, each well, the way the money comes from the federal government, it goes to each state DOT just gets a lump sum essentially. And it's based on po population is the biggest factor, right? And then each state DOT is charged with uh, allocating it those dollars among the MPOs, and they can do that however they want. We went through a process probably eight or nine years ago to develop a formula for allocating those funds, and it considers there's about eight or nine factors in that. Population is a big one, but there's also um, the level of work that's required, whether you have air quality issues, there's a whole number of things that get factored into it. And for us, 
you know, unfortunately, if you look across all those factors, a lot of them don't apply to us. And so, you know, we get, we get squeezed us and, you know, a couple of the really small MPOs in the Valley get squeezed the most through that uh, process. And I will jump in and say that while population is a factor in that population or growth rate is not, and growth rate tends to drive a lot of the work in the MPO area. I can send hey, you a summary I, I of that distribution you. formula if you'd like. Yeah, if you could, yeah. Tyler, do you, you said it was developed seven or eight years ago, is that yes. right? Yes. Is there anything built into it to have any kind of review? Yes, we're going to actually, when the 2020 census information is finalized, we are going to kick in, we will kick off a, an update, a review at least of that process. And so we've been, we, the all the state, M, the MPOs in the state, we've been in touch with Eric Havig and his, his group. And I think they're expecting that update or that review process to start, you know, summer or fall is going to kind of depend upon when we get, um, when the census numbers are finalized and, and they have staffing availability to help run that process. Can you keep me kind of updated on how that goes? Because I think um, I have an interest in making sure that the issue of the rapid growth is, is addressed sufficiently. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we can definitely do that. And I'll send you the I'll send you the formula. I mean, it's just a simple one pager that just kind of yeah. you can do a quick look at it. Yeah, yeah. All right. Any other questions on this one before I move forward? Yeah. Um, this slide just shows. I mean, there's just three of us, and Andrea is not, not full time. She's 0.8 FTE. So. Um, <laughs> You know, we have a fair amount of work, and this is a slide that we'd shown to our policy board just so that they know kind of what we're doing, you know, in terms of our responsibilities. I'm not going to walk through it, but uh, it's just there if you're interested in seeing how we kind of break down our major work items. And then this slide, this is one we've shown as well. This is just, I mean, we have a pretty cyclical work program environment that we step through. And so in terms of things we have to do. So you can see that we have annual requirements. We have stuff we're doing every two to four years. Um, and then every five years is our big thing is updating our long range plan. And so as we, you know, we've built out a timeline with these things, with all these different projects in it for the next four to five years, you know, and then for us, it's trying to determine where we have gaps and how we can best utilize those that those gaps that we do have. And I think that's like right now, that's why Andrea is leading the mobility hubs project, for instance. And there's going to be different things like that going forward where we will try to fill in as we have time, you know, to help help um, help the city bend, CET and others with some of their planning efforts. And so we just boiled down our work program into one slide up to this next fiscal year. Uh, some of the big things that are on there, uh, we will be initiating an update to our long range plan, uh, probably in the second half of this next fiscal year, the mobility hub feasibility study, which Andrea will talk to after we get through these next few slides. Um, we're gonna be developing a new transportation improvement program. That's our capital improvement program for the years 2024 to 2027. We have to have that wrapped up next spring. At the same time that we're working on that, Andre will be leading a process to allocate the next round of STBG funding out to some of you, hopefully. There's a lot happening on the climate change uh, side of things, and we don't know quite yet what that's gonna mean for us as an MPO, but there's gonna be a lot of planning require new planning requirements for the city of Bend, and we will definitely be engaged in some of that. <laughs> As they start. We have some ongoing safety planning. Um, ODOT has three major projects uh, that are either underway or will be underway within the MPO. There's the Baker Road interchange planning process that's underway now, and then there will be plans kicking off fairly soon for US 20 and for uh, US 97 and Reed Market area. And then down below, um, the thing I'll mention there, probably the, one of the bigger ones we have is there's a lot of, lot of work happening in terms of updating our transportation model. Um, and then 
we're getting ready to kick off a new household travel activity survey uh, probably in sometime in 2023, but the development process of that is well underway at this point. Hey, Tyler, I had a question really quick. Um, regarding the climate change legislation, we've been hearing at the Park District kind of rumors of this. Do you have any insight in terms of timing and kind of the breadth of changes that are going to be required for agencies that are doing transportation planning work or just a source that I could go look at this because we keep hearing that it's going to be a big deal, but I don't think any of us at the park district really know much about it. Yeah, it's, I mean, I can give you just a couple of things and I think I'll ask, I mean, I've been trying to track it, but it's been, it's pretty, been a very overwhelming pro process. I'll put it that way because the, there's a rule making yeah. advisory committee, you know, that's leading that effort. And, you know, the packets that are coming out, that group has been meeting once a month or once every two months. And these packets that have been generated are, you know, sometimes pushing a 175 pages of information every two, every month to two months. And so trying to keep up with it has been exceptionally challenging, but there's going to be a few of the big things that are coming out of it are um, the city of Bend will have to designate what are called climate friendly areas. And they will have to have that done, I think, by... June of 2023, and I think those areas will, it'll be assumed that those, those geographies will absorb at least 30% of all future housing development within the city. Wow. And then within those climate friendly areas, there are a pretty strict set of transportation planning requirements in terms of, um, you know, the assumption being that the, I think the majority of trips within those areas will be, you know, biking, walking, or transit, you know, or micro mobility, something like that. Oh, and, and then there's changes to the parking uh, requirements in the transportation planning rule. Uh, there's a big, big uh, set of changes to uh, transportation system planning requirements for cities, you know, within the state's eight metro areas. Um, I'll see if I can find a summary of it for you. I mean, I haven't seen like a simple summary, but I'm assuming there's something out there. Yeah, no, I'd really appreciate that. That sounds very um, exciting and daunting all at the same time. Yeah. It is. Henry, also, um, Damien Sternick at the city, he's following this really closely um, and he's on that committee. I, if you would reach out to him, I think he'd happily like, summarize it. Everything oh, great. Oh, yeah, thanks. Great job. Will do. Oops, I see David, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was I was just gonna say if you if you just look up the DLCD climate friendly and equitable communities rulemaking process, their page has all the the information on it. I wouldn't um, suggest looking at kind of earlier iterations of the packet because most of it is month the monthly packets just get updated and revised, um, and earlier versions just have a lot of blanks or highlights that'll be filled in later. Um, but the most recent one, yeah, it is it is cumbersome, as Tyler said, but probably the most recent um, set of documents is mostly complete and get, can give you a good flavor and you can kind of jump around to the sections that that are relevant for you. Yeah, it's good. Thanks. What I don't know is, I mean, yeah, definitely don't look at older versions <laughs> that are posted. Look at the most current, which I think is January, maybe. So I've got it sitting right here with me. Um, but what I don't know is if there's a track changes version of it, because I've been trying to get through this off and on for the last couple of weeks. And it's like trying to understand what the changes are is a little bit challenging because there's not a clear, here's what we have today versus here's what you're going to do in the future. And particularly with transportation planning requirements for you know cities within the MPO areas. And, and how much additional funding is coming with these new requirements, by the way? <laughs> Well, at, this, um, at this point, zero, but there's I mean, there's a big request to ODOT. But wait, the, there's the, more. Yeah. Um, one of the um, items that the OTC is considering in use of the discretionary funds from IJA is to allocate $15 million to help um, local planning folks um, address this. You know, the, it's, it's not going to cover everything, but maybe it'll help a little bit. Unfortunately, I think the timing of these rules, um, you know, I'm not sure we're gonna get the money rolled out before they have to go into effect, but maybe there's, you know, a way to backfill expenditures. So it is something that we're looking at. 
pretty pretty close. We'll have to redo the TSP a couple of years. <laughs> Bring Karen back. Yes. Big sigh. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? So this is a start. This is, I said, this is a summary. I mean, there's a lot more to it. The document is pretty lengthy, but this boils down, you know, our work program for this next fiscal year. All right. This slide shows our draft budget. And I think you'll see, I mean, if you're, if you're familiar at all with our prior budgets, this proposed budget is by far the biggest we've ever had. And it's because of that highlighted item in there. We received some COVID funding, uh, COVID relief funding, and we have not spent that yet. And unlike most federal funding, we actually received the funding. I mean, in the past, it's always when we get federal funding usually sits it out on until we need it. This funding, we have it now in our account essentially. And so that is showing up in this uh, proposed budget for next year. And so that you know, significantly inflates our uh, budget. We're hoping that we can get those funds allocated, probably not at the end of this fiscal year, but in the, probably in the first quarter of next fiscal year. And so more to come on that. Any questions on this one? And this just, you can see this breaks it out by funding source and then within our work program, we have four major work areas and you can see that at the bottom right, um, how those funds are allocated among those four major work areas. Any questions? So, oh, Wendy, you're muted. I am indeed, thank you. So what kinds of things are you foreseeing using this COVID relief funding for? Like what would that what kind of program did that go into? Do you have any idea at this point? Yeah, I mean, right now, at least, our board is interested in trying to utilize them for some bike ped related improvements uh, associated with the North Corridor project in Bend. Since oh. so they're waiting right now, the city of Bend is part of the city of Bend has a contract right now looking at uh, bike ped connectivity options between um, kind of essentially where there's that new kind of strip mall area where um, what's there, Chick-fil-A and Cracker Barrel, that kind of stuff on the, just to the east of 97 between that area and the Boyd Acres Neighborhood Association, which is to the east of the railroad tracks. And so they're looking at, uh, the city has a contract right now and they're looking at feasibility options of either going up and over the new highway alignment and the railroad or trying to potentially go underneath both like with a tunnel option. They'll have the results of that feasibility study, I think, in April or May of this, you know, this spring. And once that, once that feasibility study is done, that will help determine. I mean, if it's feasible and wants to move forward, then a good a good chunk or all of these funds could be dedicated to a project of that nature up in that area. Oh, I mean, I'm aware, we're aware. Uh, BPAC is sort of aware of that those projects, but I didn't realize that we could use that funding towards it. So that's really interesting. Great. Right? <laughs> and then um, Tyler is Rory from the city still, I think he's planning to present an update to that feasibility study at the next policy board meeting this, uh, this month, as far as I know, unless you've heard Yeah, that it. sounds right. And I think yeah. and what we can do too is we can schedule. So yeah, Rory Rowan from the city of Bend is leading that effort. We can schedule him at a future TAC meeting uh, to give an update on the work that they're doing up there. And I think, and there's other options too up in that area. Another, if that if that's not deemed to be feasible, or if it's deemed to be too expensive, whatever you know, if it doesn't come out in a positive way, then there's also some other trail connectivity issues that are not funded up there as part of that project. That I think would be pretty favorable from the policy board perspective to allocate funding towards. So there's a few kind of bigger items that are being looked at up in that area that I think where these dollars will probably get allocated to. Thank you. Yep. All right. Any other questions? All right. So this slide, just a little bit of our process. Um, we have our, a review of our work program, draft work program and budget with our federal partners and ODOT um, on Thursday this week. And then we will be uh, scheduling our budget committee meeting 
or late March or early April, and then getting this adopted hopefully in late April or early May. So any questions or anything else you'd like to see us potentially trying to tackle or partner with any of you on in this next fiscal year? Tyler, uh, this is, oh, sorry, Peter, if you wanna go. All right. You beat um, no, no, you go first. Uh, just an FYI, we did ask for some assistance from the Ben MPO looking at our Ben Dialeride optimization. Um, and so we just recently got approval from the Deschutes County Commissioners to go after a discretionary grant that's gonna pay for some uh, travel training. Uh, and what that means is, um, you know, the ability to uh, train folks, get them off of dial ride and on to fixed route if it's feasible. Um, and so Tyler just saying that there is some potential partnership between the two of us if we receive that funding, if Andrea is interested in, in helping with that effort again. Okay, good. Yeah, and we kept a um, kind of a general line item for uh, transit coordination and assistance. Peter? There, I finally got the button to work. Um, so I know in the past, and we've looked at the census data for how people do journey to work, that telecommuting was getting a larger and larger share. So I didn't know if you guys were going to look at any way to enhance that. So between, you know, buses and um, telecommuting, you know, that you can address congestion by having people not take that trip in the first place, except electronically. And then given COVID and remote working, if there's any work on that or other jurisdictions have done that you can just, you know, plagiarize and apply to bend. Um, I don't know if anybody's any, doing any, what I would consider to be like true planning around that issue, other than just kind of monitoring it and trying to determine, you know, the extent of it and what the impacts are. I think that's the, the bigger question that I'm hearing, at least from other folks, is people aren't making those work trips, but they're making, if they're working at home, then they're making a lot more trips in the daytime doing other things. You know, and so I think there's a fair amount of research or monitoring out there trying to determine, you know, with this increasing share of work from home, what are people actually doing in the daytime and how, what, how are they getting around? And where are they going? And that household survey, well, um, that should kind of give some shed some light on that, I would hope. Yes, definitely. Yeah, and I think that'll be an interesting thing for us to track because prior, you know, pre-COVID, we had one of the highest work from home rates, Deschutes County did, one of the highest work from home rates in, in the United States. We we're in the top five areas for at least, you know, for much of the past decade. And so it's gonna be interesting to see when we get new survey data, how has that changed? All right. All right, so that's what we have on that item. I'll jump to agenda item six is member roundtable. And I think Rick, I'll let you jump in first and give an update on your projects. Sorry about that. I was trying to get my mouse to work and it wasn't being really uh, handy there. Still trying. There. Um, I've got a handful of projects in the area, like the Highway 20 uh, facility plan that Tyler had mentioned, and also the Reed Market study. Those are still in our procurement pipeline right now. Um, there's the TULIP, the Transportation and Land Use Planning uh, Program, the funding program, and they had to update that. Um, they ran out of money. They had to refunish, replenish it with money, and then... Um, go back out and have the consultants basically get requalified. So we should have that list coming out either this month or early next month. And then the uh, RFPs will all go out, should have people on board for both projects and a notice to proceed. I'm assuming sometime around April. That's all I have, Tyler. All right, thank you. Andre, do you want to give your update? <clears throat> Yeah, I always forget to unmute. Yeah, there you go. Um, so the Bend Mobility Hub Feasibility Study recently kicked off um, late December. So this is a result of a joint grant application between the Bend and PO, uh, Cascades East Transit, and the City of Bend. And we each have our own roles in the project. So, you know, for example, the MPO is 
um, project manager for the grant, Cascade Beast Transit will be uh, leading public engagement and the advisory committee for the project. And then City of Bend staff uh, are on our project, uh, project team member and then providing project guidance. So our goal with this study is to determine the best approach to implementation and management of mobility hubs. So these will be areas, I think you're probably all familiar, but these will be areas where you could have multiple transportation options along with other types of amenities. Uh, you know, the eventual development of these hubs would support CET's plans to move away from their current hub and spoke system where, you know, you have everything going in and out of Hawthorne Station and instead have more of a multi-centric system or multiple hub locations. So there's lots of questions um, that we're hoping to get answers out of the study. So, you know, for example, where do they go? What do they look like? What types of amenities? How do we scale them? Who owns and manages what? Uh, are there synergy opportunities with private development? So, and, and other questions. So uh, CET has put together the project webpage. That is where you can find all project related information and also how to attend meetings. All of our TAC meetings are open to anyone. Our first one was January 19th, which was basically just an introduction to the project. Our next one is February 16th at 2.30, virtual meeting, and we will be going over uh, the best practices memo. So looking at other areas that have implemented uh, mobility hub type systems and hoping to glean some information from them. And then additionally, I'll be coming back with an update to both the TAC and the policy board later in the spring. Uh, this is, a very kind of quick moving project. We're hoping to wrap it up by July. So I think by late spring, I should be able to bring back some, uh, some tangible info for you. Any questions? Thank you, Andrea. Yeah. Does anybody else on the TAC have anything they'd like to share in terms of just project updates or program updates? So I've got two, two quick ones. Um, the Deschutes County TSP, we're in the process of updating that. Um, we're gonna give an update to our planning commission. They're our public advisory um, you know, body. So we've got a draft project list, which uh, Kittleson has put together. They're the consultants on this. So that's uh, this uh, February 10th at 5.30. It'll typical, like everybody else will be on a Zoom meeting. And then um, we actually have a scope of work approved by ODOT for our transportation growth management grant, which will update the Tumalo community plan. It'll be the transportation element and we're updating the Tumalo community plan overall. So Kittleson, again, we're doing the transportation part, which will look at things like bike ped issues, transit issues, um, working in cooperation with Andrea, um, you know, where you might want to put a transit stop in Tumalo, um, other uh, working with ODOT about how to get across US 20, things of that nature, what other bike ped facilities we might need. Um, and then uh, there's that TGM grant, it's not part of the Bend MPO era, but area, but we're also looking at rural trails and sisters. So that'll come forward. And then the TSP also has a bike ped element in it as well. We've worked with BPAC on that. So that's all I've got from the wonderful world of long range planning in Deschutes County. Well, we're updating our comp plan as well. Great, thank you. Dave, I see your hand up. Uh, thank you. Um, so real quick from BPAC, um, things we've been working on, uh, the, the TSP is a big one for us. It's kind of been in, in process, uh, waiting for Kittleson to come up with their, their draft project list. So we expect that to be heating up again. <laughs> um, really trying to focus on pushing the bike ped pieces across the finish line. And uh, we're also reviewing our goals for 2022. So if anybody has any thoughts on what BPAC ought to be doing, feel free to reach out to me and be happy to hear about that. Um, and uh, finally, we're preparing our annual report for the Board of County Commissioners. Hope to present that to them sometime in March, or excuse me, sometime in February. Thank you. All right, thank you. Andrea? Hey there, um, just wanted to give a 
kind of a downer update on CT. Um, we had a big staff meeting this past January to kind of reprioritize, um, you know, the agency uh, for this calendar year. Um, STIF, the new funding source that came about uh, in 2019, really excited the agency uh, in order to expand services, uh, go into areas we haven't served before. The reality is uh, the pandemic has hit the agency hard in terms of driver shortages and labor. Um, we unfortunately are gonna be reducing service again come this Saturday uh, on our regional routes. Um, we are still operating at a reduced frequency here for the city of Bend. Um, and so just wanted to alert um, the TAC that we are kind of refocusing our efforts on recruitment, retainment. Uh, we are renegotiating our collective bargaining agreement with the union and increasing uh, driver wages uh, to hopefully retain our current workforce. Obviously, COVID has hit us pretty hard as well. Um, so just wanted to set the expectations that CET is kind of what I call going back to the basics this year uh, and ensuring that we can deliver on our core services before we really start to expand into new territory. Even if this funding is, is coming about, I can't do any of it without a labor force. So just wanted to put that out there that that's what we are dealing with this year. Andrea, does that mean like for the two proposed new routes in Bend, will implementation of those be delayed? Yes. Um, and so we went through kind of the priority list. Um, you know, our number one priority is Bend Dial Ride um, and our Medicare um, brokerage to ensure people are getting to certain appointments. Um, we have the fleet, we have the schedule. I just don't have the humans to drive vehicles. So uh, unfortunately, yes, uh, that is delayed. Um, but as soon as we can amp up the workforce, uh, we will definitely implement that. Um, I'm hoping that the new CBA uh, will be full effect March 1st, uh, which will see an increase uh, in base pay for our drivers uh, and continue to recruit. All right, thank you. Dave? Uh, Andre, I was just curious, how much flexibility does your budget process have for increasing wage expense because i mean clearly that's that's the big thing if you read the article a couple of weeks ago in the paper about you know kfc's now got lots of employees because they raised their pay to 25 dollars an hour <laughs> you know that's that's what it's going to take and i'm just wondering how much flexibility you guys have right and so i will say um you know the stif um budgets mainly we're keeping the operations pretty vague because we wanted to go to increased um, cost to pay our drivers. Uh, we're going after less capital uh, and pretty much all operating funding grants humanly possible mm -hmm. to pay for the increase. Um, the entire driver staff received an increase of 6% July 1 of last year. We're anticipating another increase of between probably 5 and 10% uh, this coming month. Um, and so this is this is where the budget needs to go at this point in time. Otherwise, I can't deliver. And are, are there also issues um, on the capital side of things in terms of actually being able to able to acquire, you know, replacement vehicles, that type of thing? Um, so two points on that. One is we are starting to actually experience our first delays in the manufacturing side. So. In addition to this, we are procuring more vehicles that don't require CDL, uh, more passenger style, so that we can easily recruit um, folks that may not have a CDL. Um, we have had vehicles cancel on us, meaning they can't even make them and deliver them. Uh, so that is delaying all of our uh, capital grant purchases, either through ODOT or the FTA. Um, and then you know, we, we understand that there's probably more capital grants coming down the line from Washington in the coming years. So uh, we're kind of putting that on the back burner until uh, we can build up again. Great. Thank you. Sorry for the downer. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for the update. Um, anybody else have any updates, project or program updates they'd like to share? Yes, Sharon. Um, thanks. Uh, just kind of uh, wanting to commiserate with Andrea. We feel your pain at the school district. Um, we are also in the same 
challenge of getting drivers in. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's not easy, you know, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, housing is a big factor. Uh, pay is a big factor. COVID is a big factor. So yeah, it's, it's, um, it's not getting any easier. I would say that one interesting thing that has been proposed and I kind of blew it off for a while, but I'm getting serious about they, the drivers all would love on-site childcare. Um, and that's a realm we've just never been into. Um, but if that's uh, an area that Tammy Bainey and myself have to look at, uh, that is what we're willing to do to uh, keep staff working for us. Yeah, that is another big factor. And and maybe, maybe there's a, some collaboration opportunity there yep. for all bus drivers, yep. district and CET, and so maybe we should think about. Yep. Right. Uh, um, considering that we may not have a lot of transit options, I'm continuing to work with Toby over at the city of Bend on some micro mobility options and bikes and scooters. Our, our current update is that he's looking at um, bringing in a bike share provider with e-bikes for the probably early summer, most likely. Um, and with that, uh, Toby has been working with his uh, streets department to develop some concepts for mini mobility points. So. I feel like this is, we're not trying to steal any thunder away from mobility hubs and the, the work that the MPO and CET are working on for more formalized and kind of uh, established hubs, but um, mobility points in, in what Toby's preparing um, are like how to convert a parallel parking space into a point where you could have bike parking, um, maybe some paint on the ground, um, to designate that and that, you know, that could support bike share or it could support just personal um, biking and other um, transportation options. And so um, Toby's working with, again, I don't know if there's going to be any kind of review options, um, but he's uh, looking to include concepts in their new street and development standards. So um, those will range from what he's calling uh, small, medium, and I think large, um, different kind of general templates or concepts that could be applied. So if you have one parking space, it would be a small one. If you have a couple parallel park parking spaces and a little sidewalk space, it could be a medium. Um, and so anyway, I think it's a great progress in that, you know, just having something like that in streets standards um, as, you know, say a private developer comes in and puts in something they could uh, allocate some space for us to have those um, many points of connection between transportation options. All right, thank you, Casey. Oops. All right, Greg, do you have a comment? I'm sorry, yeah. Casey, uh, what's the, uh, what, what happened to the bikes that we purchased from uh, Portland? You know anything about that? Yeah, um, part, partly supply chain issues of getting controllers to retrofit those old bikes with a more modern technology um, led, uh, you know, I could say it was Toby's decision, but I think I was a part of that and saying, hey, let's let's look at different options. Um, that would have delayed us quite a while, potentially into late this year. Um, and then also that system would require there to be some annual funding kind of on the part of local agencies to support it. Um, so now looking kind of more at, well, if these private companies want to partner with the city of Bend and uh, they think they can do that then let's let's look at what that involves so they're just kind of working through agreements right now as to what those terms might be if uh, a company like a bird or a lime were to launch here and then that's not really anything decided just yet so if there are feed if there is feedback anybody could send it my way or 
find Toby's contact information at the city of Bend. Um, but yeah, uh, looking at different options there that would, wouldn't require a big financial investment up front, more so in the city staff kind of planning and allocating space for stations and um, contracting or, you know, just establishing agreements for public use of public right away for that purpose. Okay. I was just wondering, was that money spent or was it just on hold for the, for those bikes? No, nothing was spent that I know of. And so I think Toby has been working with Andrea here to see if we can repurpose those funds. For yeah. Other, so, more. you know, the money was allocated to bike share and um, for the purchase of, and reef uh, furbishing those bikes. However, with, you know, what's happened and Toby's still trying to make, bike share happen, just not quite as originally proposed. So those funds are still there for him for bike share improvements, um, bike share related improvements. So he does, he, they haven't been spent yet, but they are still there for him for that purpose. Okay. Okay. And Greg, I think Toby, we're going to try and get him to give an update to the board on that project. I mean, the status on, on that, I think in either March or April, He'll be giving an update, so there'll be more a more formalized update. Okay. All right. Anything else from anyone? Well, Tyler, if we have we have a couple more minutes, I could show the um, demographic viewer tool. Uh, the sure. Track. Anyone want to see that? Yeah. You do you have it pulled up? Yes. Let me see how. Okay. I don't see an option. How do I share my screen? Should just be on the bottom of, um, oh, here we go. bottom center. Are you able to see a map? Yes. Make it bigger. There you go. So um, this is our refined demographic viewer tool that we've kind of worked with city staff to recently put together. So it's an interactive map. Um, I'll show you how it works in a second. And we have it um, embedded into our MPO website. Uh, you can go there to access it and it uses seven different data sets. So previously we had static maps for five population data sets, but having an application like this um, you know, we now have an easier way of visualizing multiple um, demographic data sets and the ability to add other data sets into it that, you know, could be transportation specific. So, um, for example, how this works is in, we have a layer list. Uh, well, first of all, the, the demographics that are mapped are, we have, you know, those living below the poverty level those living below 200% of the federal poverty level, usually that's kind of used as low income indicator. Population with disabilities, seniors, non-white and Hispanic population, population with limited English proficiency, uh, and zero car households. So how we use this, we have our layer list to the right. Um, the first thing I'll show you is the summary. So it summarizes uh, all these different data sets. You click on that, and then um, if you click on a particular block group, it will pop up a summary of the different percentages of the demographics that we have. Um, and you can do that for a number of all the different uh, block groups in the area. And so say you wanted to see specifically population living below federal poverty level, um, there's the color coding with the percentages, uh, and then that would populate for you. And then the same goes for all the other ones. So for example, zero car households, there's the percentage breakdown by color. And uh, you click on it and, it and it populates for you. So how I, you know, the first thing I think of is how can MPO use this? Um, you know, we could add it to our project application process. 
know, essentially adding a layer of those project locations, what those projects are, would those projects, could those projects be seen as a benefit um, to the demographics in the area or not? Um, we can also add in uh, layers for crash data, uh, speed limits if we wanted to, number of travel lanes, bike head information, common destinations, I mean, a number of, of different things. So the city has something similar to this um, using the original five MPO data sets, but they are developing theirs to be used um, across multiple departments, where ours we will remain transportation specific. Um, any, any questions there? No, Andrea, I just wanted to say, <clears throat> I think this is really great. You know, it's, it's interesting. We all, all the agencies had gotten together last year with the collective impact bend group and talked about doing like an equity mapping project. And then we've kind of all gone our own directions. Um, and we actually just went through a very similar process for the park district where we mapped the same um, American community survey data. It looks like that you guys are using. And um, we also created a composite map where we've created an equity score, like a potential disadvantage score for each one of these block groups where we combined all those factors to try to help us say, hey, you know, where can our projects have the most impact? Um, but I, I'd love to get together with you offline sometime and kind of talk about your map and, and show you ours. And yeah, you know, I'd, I'd be willing to share that resource with members of the TAC as well. And yeah, yeah I think it's really exciting great. with mapping We're stuff all, that's happening. Yeah, it's all kind of new and we're all, seeing our own different needs, but I'm certainly open to however we can improve it, improve this. You know, the static maps are kind of our first crack at it. And this is kind of slowly developing and being able to um, add more data sets to it or what you're talking about with the scoring, um, however we can improve it, I would. Yeah. You know, one thing that's really interesting is the the decennial census data starting to be released. I was looking at some of the redistricting data that's out right now, and the the granularity of the the census data is getting better and better for our region. And we, you know, they're starting to see some data at the block level versus this data, which is at the block group level. And uh, yeah, it'll be really interesting to see to see what's in that census data when it come comes out. I started nerding out and looking at household size and already was seeing household sizes that are a lot larger than I think everyone has been assuming for the city of Bend and some other interesting data. So it's uh yeah, exciting times if you're if you're a census data nerd. I was gonna say this is like crack cocaine for transportation planners and planners in general. <laughs> the the one thing I've always wondered about the the zero car household and there's no way that you could get to it is how many of that are by choice and how many of that is by economic reason. Um, I imagine most of them are probably more economic reason than by choice, but there is that subset, yeah. but yeah, this is well, pretty I mean, cool stuff. You can overlay some of these and then the ones that get darker, you know, it's a little more. Mm -hmm. I think here's our main spot here. Um, as far as looking at zero car households in relation to uh, income. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, you, you can be sucked in because I've done this. You can be sucked in for hours on this stuff. It's just, <laughs> it's so cool. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Stop sharing here. All right. Um, Let's pop this back up just a minute. So anybody have any, Wendy, I guess, or Doreen, any or few residents that are on here have any questions or comments they'd like to share? Now, as always, I'm interested in kind of the bike ped stuff being on BPAC, but as a member, not representing. So, um, but yeah, no, it's all good stuff. And um, I enjoyed coming today. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I, 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 this is Greg, and I'll. Uh, am I on? Yeah, and and uh, I'll, I'll send you an email. I I'm just question. I'm going to be questioning uh, allocation from the federal government, but I'll ask that. I don't want to spend time on that with everybody here. Thank you. Yeah. This is Doreen. Thanks for letting me join. Um, 
I I was wondering, for one, that static map is really cool. Are you guys doing that for city-owned properties outside of city limits? Or can you, the demographics maps? It's within the MPO, I believe. Yeah, so we're looking at just the um, block groups within the MPO area, but those um, the census tracks, the larger geographies do go outside of the MPO area. So, um, but the only population that we're mapping by census tract is um, those living with disabilities. So this, the, the data is there outside of the MPO, but what we're um, mapping is within the MPO area. Okay, all right. And I, I'm not sure how much of the letter that I had forwarded is even appropriate for this forum, but I would ask that as, as you guys put all of you know, your budgets together and uh, apply funding to just remember that you know, the money that we accept from the FAA um, towards the Bend Airport, it, it is a substantial amount of money, but the amount of health and physical risk to those living around and led you know, unabated that stays in the environment for over a thousand years where they're proving in studies that it does harm the environment and the kids and drops IQs. I just that we, we really consider that when we take federal monies from the FAA because as they've done down at the Reed Hillview Airport because that community accepted the money, FAA is demanding they stay open for another 10 years despite what it's done to the local kids. <clears throat> And I would be happy to help, you know, dig information. Anything I can do to help just keep a really educated decisions around the airport for as much money as it has the potential of bringing in and putting out also the, the ripple effect of the damages to the environment and the things people seek Bend, Oregon out for. All right. Thank you, Dr. Um, any other comments? If not, our next meeting is tentatively scheduled for March 2nd at 10 a.m. And with that, I will adjourn the meeting. Good. Bye, everyone. Hey, Rick, Bye. I sent you an email if you want to call me right now with my cell number. Oh, thanks, Henry. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.